Hi guys, we're here for day three of celebrating live theater through picture books. Today we're doing Coppola, which is a famous ballet, as told by Margaret Frazon, paintings by Stephen Jolson and Louis Frechier. Many years ago, in a small village in the middle of Europe, there lived a doll maker named Dr. Coppelius. Dr. Coppelius was a true artist, and the dolls he made were even finer than those in the best shops in the great city of Nuremberg. But Dr. Coppelius, who was also something of an alchemist, dabbled in magic spells and potions, and was a mystery to all other villagers. Early one fine summer morning, Dr. Coppelius stepped out of his front door into the village square and looked up and down at his first floor window. This window was thrown open, and inside, apparently, reading a book, sat his newest, most perfect creation, a life-size doll he called Coppola. She is my masterpiece, Dr. Coppola thought to himself. The finest work I have ever done. She looks as if she were alive. Dr. Coppola smiled wistfully and went back into his house, although he was not accustomed to the sensation of happiness and could hardly recognize it. The old man did feel a warm, pleasant glow in his heart. Just as Dr. Coppola dis disappeared into his house, the younger villager, Swanelda, emerged from her house across the village square. Swanelda was full of the joy of one in love. She was betrothed to France, the most handsome and charming young man in the entire village, and she could barely keep herself from dancing instead of walking. As she packed Dr. Coppola's house, Swandella noticed the girl in the window and paused. Surely that grumpy old recluse can't have such a beautiful daughter, she thought. Perhaps she is a niece, come to visit. Swanelda stood under the window, curtsied, and smiled. Good morning, she said. To her surprise, the girl in the window ignored her and went right on reading. Well, they certainly don't teach manners wherever she is from, thought Swanelda. But to be pleasant, she curtsied again and said, Excuse me, I want to welcome you to our village. Still, the girl gave no indication that she had heard Swanelda. She simply kept on reading her book. Perhaps she thinks herself too grand to talk to mere villagers, thought Swanelda, trying to conceal her irritation. She turned to leave, but just then she caught the sight of Franz approaching. Curious to see what would happen when Franz noticed the newcomer in the window, Swanelda decided to hide close by and watch. Franz was a cheerful fellow, and this morning he was especially happy, for he was on his way to see Swanelda. He came into the village square and was about to cross Swanelda's house when the girl in the window caught his eye. Doffing his hat and bowing graciously, he said, "'Pardon me for interrupting you, but may I say good morning? My name is Franz.' When the young lady showed no sign of interest, Franz thought, "'Perhaps being a stranger, she is very shy.' He bowed once more. "'I see you are a newcomer to our village. I bid you welcome.' Still the girl took no notice. This surprised Franz. It was the first time any young lady had not wanted to talk to him, and it stung his pride. He was just about to leave when he thought he saw the girl sway ever so slightly. Just out of sight, the mysterious old doll maker crouched behind Capella, winding up a key in her back. He was smiling, greatly pleased that Franz believed his creation to be real. In the moment the winding was done, the doll lowered her book, raised her right hand to her lips, and blew a kiss to Franz's direction. Franz happily blew her several kisses in return. Swanelda, who had been laughing a moment before, was suddenly very jealous. Leaving her hiding place behind, she ran into the square, pretending to chase after a butterfly. When Franz saw Swanelda, he felt rather guilty. Hoping to please her, he joined the chase. With a flourish, he caught the imaginary butterfly and, taking an imaginary pin from his jacket pocket, attached it to his hat. At that, Swanelda burst into tears. How could you be so cruel? She cried and ran home. A few hours later, the village square was full of people. The villagers were preparing for a celebration the next day, 
and everyone, apart from Franz and Swinelda, was in a festive mood. At noon, the burgomaster made an announcement. On the morrow, the new town bell is to be de dedicated, he called out in a clear, crisp voice. In honor of this event, there will be a special festivities, and any couples who marry will receive handsome dowries from the lord of the manor. The villagers were thrilled. Several young men proposed on the spot and were joyfully accepted by their sweethearts. Only Franz and Swinelda hesitated. Franz watched closely as the burgomaster turned to Swinelda, asking if she would be wed the next day. Swinelda chose to follow the local custom of listening to an ear of wheat for her answer. If a girl should hear the wheat whisper to her, then her beloved was said to be true and she would marry him. If the wheat was silent, her beloved would not. The burgomaster held the wheat for Swinelda. She listened closely, but there was no sound. Her friends held the wheat to her ear, but she still heard nothing, not even a whisper. Even Franz tried holding the wheat, but still Swinelda heard no sound at all. "'There's no sound,' Swinelda said to Franz. "'You must love another.' "'What do you mean?' Franz cried. But without another word, Swinelda turned and hurried away with her friends, leaving Franz alone amid the celebrating couples. In the late afternoon, the villagers left the town square for their suppers. Thankfully, for the quiet Dr. Capellus emerged from his house, carefully locked his front door with a large key, which he then wrapped in his handkerchief and tucked safely into his coat pocket, and headed for the inn for a drink. Dr. Capellus's thoughts were on Coppola. She was so perfect. Oh, my beautiful Coppola, he mused. You are almost human. If only I could give you a real heart like mine. Dr. Coppolis had not gone far, however, when he encountered a group of boisterous village boys who began to tease him. "'Come dance with us, old man!' said one, laughing. "'What so light-hearted as you would surely liven our evening!' said another. Dr. Coppolis raised his walking stick and cracked one young man on the shoulder, then another on the shin. "'Leave me alone!' he shouted. Smarting from Dr. Coppola's stick, the boys ran off. Dr. Coppolis took his handkerchief out of his pocket and wiped his brow. He was too agitated to notice that his house had been dropped into the ground. Cursing the boorish bo village boys, he continued on to the inn, passing Swinelda and her friends on the way. A moment later, Swinelda noticed the key on the ground. Realizing this must be the key to Dr. Coppolis's house, she picked it up and called to her friends, Let's try it! Let's go inside! The girls were doubtful. Come on, Swinelda urged. I would like to have a girl word with the girl who blew kisses to Franz this morning. The girls looked at one another, then up at the shuttered house, and their curiosity overcame them. Soon they were laughing and pushing one another toward the front door. Shh, Swinelda cautioned as she tried the key. It turned, and the girls slipped inside. As they climbed the dark stairs inside Coppolis's house, the girls began to feel frightened. No villagers had ever entered the mysterious house before. What would they find? At the top of the stairs, they reached a doorway leading into a large, cluttered room. The fading light of dusk filtered through the windows and all about the room. In the shadows were silent, menacing figures. They were perfectly still, even stiff but they looked just like people. Are they alive? whispered one of the girls. Swinelda gathered her courage and entered the room. She looked closely at one of the figures, then laughed. Why, it's only a doll, she cried. The girl's fear changed to delight. In a moment, they discovered the clockwork mechanisms that set the dolls in motion. One after another, they wound up the doctor's wonderful creations. All around the room, dolls were moving, striking drums, jingling bells, nodding, clapping, to the great amusement of Swinelda and her friends. But where was the pretty girl Swinelda had seen in the window? While the other girls laughed over the mechanical dolls, Swinelda searched the dark room. At last, behind a curtain, in the corner of the farthest from the door, Swinelda found the girl. She was sitting perfectly still with her book lying in her lap. Swinelda reached out to touch the stranger. 
She was cold and lifeless as the other dolls. So Nelda called to her friends. How they laughed to think of Franz making such a fool of himself over a doll. Meanwhile, having enjoyed his drink at the inn, Dr. Coppolis was making his way back home. When he reached the square, he saw the door of his house wide open. Terror struck him. Great Karatikas! he cried. What ruffians are destroying my treasures? Waving his stick and shouting angrily, he ran into the house and up the stairs. You villains! he cried. You'll pay for this! When Dr. Coppolis appeared at the door, Swanelda's friends scattered and fr fled from the angry old man in his mysterious house. But Swanelda slipped into the corner where Coppola sat and let the curtain fall back, concealing her. With the intruders gone, Dr. Coppola sat down to recover his breath and his temper. He looked at the curtain that concealed his beloved Coppola and saw that it was closed. No sooner had Dr. Coppola sighed with relief than he heard a noise from the balcony. He jumped up and went to the window, which was being opened slowly from the outside. He stood fixed in a position like one of his dolls, as Franz climbed stealthily into his room, peering into the den of, as the den of the light. Then Dr. Coppolis pounced on him. You robber! he shouted. You thief! No, no! pleaded Franz. I swear I haven't come to rob you. I saw your daughter in the window today, and I've fallen in love with her. I'd like to speak with her, with your permission, sir, of course. To Franz's surprise, Dr. Coppolis's anger seemed to disappear, and his face brightened. You wish to speak to my Coppola, he said. Then let us sit down and have some wine and talk a little. Franz was a bit suspicious of the old man's sudden friendliness, and hesitated. Come, Dr. Coppolis coaked. You have, no you have nothing to fear from me. I am just a simple doll maker. So Franz sat down and accepted the old man's wine. But when Franz drank from his goblet, he looked around, wondering where Coppola could be. Dr. Coppola's only pretended to drink from his. Soon Franz began to feel dizzy, for the wine contained a magic potion. In a few minutes, he was fast asleep. Dr. Coppola was overjoyed. Here was the chance to do what he had only dreamed of, to experiment with an ancient magic spell, and perhaps bring his Coppola to life. He drew back the curtain behind which Coppola was sealed, and she looked even more beautiful and delicate than she, he remembered. He, felt a, he fetched an old volume and impatiently turned the pages as he came upon the spell. Ah, yes, he muttered, exactly as I remember it. I must draw the life force from this sleeping youth and transfer it to my Coppola. Dr. Coppola moved his hands from, down from Franz's body, from his head to his feet, all while muttering spells, trying to put the spark of life from him. Then, holding what he had gathered from the boy with infinite care and gentleness, he walked over to Coppola, and showering it over her, he held his breath and waited. To his delight and amazement, Coppola stood up, carelessly dropping her book, and took a few steps. The old man's heart pounded. He could scarcely breathe. He returned to Franz, repeating his gestures over the boy's eyes, then once again showered the life force on Coppola. This time her eyelids stirred, and she blinked several times. Her arms, legs, and feet all came to life. Coppola began to move. <coughs> Ecstatic, Dr. Coppola returned to Franz for the third time. Trembling, he drew life from Franz's heart and transferred it to Coppola. Breathe, he whispered. Breathe. As though touched by a caressing breeze, Coppola's shoulders lifted and relaxed. She took a breath. There could be no doubt. It worked, whispered the old man. I have brought her to life. Now Coppola, who was really the clever Swinalda in Coppola's clothes, was waltzing about in front of the delighted Dr. Coppolas. Who are these people in the room with us? she asked. They are not people, merely dolls, he replied. But what about this one asleep in the chair? she asked. Who is he? Dr. Coppolas assured her that he was just another doll. 
You don't mean to tell me that there is no difference between these dolls and that young man? She asked indignantly. None whatsoever, my dear, he said. These are all dolls that I've made myself with love and... Rubbish! she interrupted. These baby dolls, but that one is definitely not. And she waltzed over to the sleeping Franz for his wine mug and lifted it to drink from it. Dr. Coppolis rushed over and snatched it from my ha her hands. No, no, you mustn't, he said. Eager to create mischief, she danced over to the magic book, reaching out to tear at its pages. This was not at all what Dr. Coppolis had expected, when he had dreamed of bringing Coppola to life. Desperately, he tried to distract Coppola first with a black metella and a fan, which he snatched from a Spanish doll, then with a rich tan-tan shawl from a Scottish doll. She danced for a moment with each, but quickly grew tired of the game and went to France to try to wake him. No, Coppola, you mustn't, scolded Dr. Coppolis. Oh, mustn't I? she retorted and flew about the room, disrupting things and setting off all the doll's mechanisms. Dr. Coppolis did not know what to do with his unruly creation. By this time, the effect of the drugged wine had begun to wear off, and Franz woke from his stupor. He looked about and saw at once that it was Fenelda flying about the workshop. "'Whatever are you doing in that dress?' he asked, feeling confused and also a bit guilty about his pursuit of Coppolis's daughter. Fenelda turned to Franz. "'If you want to know, come and look at the beautiful girl you are in love with.' With these words, Swinelda ran over to the corner and drew back the curtain. There, Franz saw the same pretty girl he had admired in the window that morning, and realized that she was no more than a wooden wax figure, a doll created by the old doctor. "'Oh, how foolish I have been,' he murmured. "'It is you I really love, Swinelda. Will you forgive me?' Swinelda gladly did, for she was very much in love with Franz and the two ran down the stairs to find the burgomaster to tell him they would indeed marry the following day. Dr. Coppolis, left alone and stunned by all that had happened, made his way down to the corner of his workshop. There he saw his greatest creation, lifeless and only partly clothed. What a fool he had been! Exhausted and with his dreams shattered, Dr. Coppolis fell to the ground in despair. France and Swinelda were married the next day with all the others amidst the great festivities in honor of the new town bell. Just after the presentation of the dowries by the lord of the manor, Dr. Coppolis appeared. He came to remind the villagers of the damages he had suffered in his workshop and demand compensation. Swinelda, feeling sorry for the old doctor, offered him the dowry money, but the kindly lord of the manor stepped forward and gave the old doll master a bag of gold instead. In the years that followed, Dr. Coppolis came to terms with his broken dreams. He realized that the satisfaction of a true artist lies in the moment of creation, not in the results. And he went on, all by himself, making more and more imaginative and perfect dolls. But never again put one in the window of his house.